Hello, we're going to talk about sample weights. This is on chapter four of Advances in Financial Machine Learning by Marcos Lopez de Prado. Um, our motivation for this presentation is in, on previous chapters, we have learned how to produce a continuous homogeneous unstructured data set from a collection of unstructured financial data. It's a constant step size, lean space sampling, or randomly using uniform sampling. On this chapter, we are addressing observations that are not generated by independent and identically distributed process. The IID is an underlying assumption of machine learning literature, yet unrealistic when dealing with financial data time series. We start with the overlapping outcomes in describing the problem. Overlapping outcomes happens when two outcomes coincide in an observation. This implies that series of labels are not IID whenever there is an overlap between any two consecutive outcomes. We try a solution which is restricting the back horizon to such that the overlap no longer exists because every feature outcome is determined before or at the onset of the next observed feature. This would lead to models where the feature sampling frequency would be limited by the horizon used to determine the outcome. If we wish to investigate the outcomes that lasted a month, features would have to be sampled with a frequency up to monthly. If we increase the sampling frequency to daily, we should, we should be forced to reduce the outcome horizon to one day. Furthermore, if we wish to apply a path dependent labeling technique like the triple barrier method, the sampling frequency would be subordinated to the first barrier touch. As a result, restricting the outcome horizon to eliminate overlaps is a terrible solution, which brings back the problem of overlapping outcomes. There are several ways to attack the problem of non-IID labels by designing sampling and weighting schemes that correct for the undue influence of overlapping outcomes. We will address it by designing sampling and weighting schemes that correct for the influence of the overlapping outcomes. Let's move to the number of concurrent labels. Two labels, EY and YJ, are concurrent at t when both are a function of one common return. The overlap does not need to be perfect such that labels spanning the same time interval. We will compute the number of labels that are a function of a given return. In order to compute the number of labels, we, the labels concurrent, we follow the formulas in the book, and also we have put in a slide the codes for um, this problem. Let's move to the average uniqueness of a label. We are going to estimate the label's uniqueness non-overlap as its average uniqueness over its lifespan. First, the uniqueness of the label i at time t is uti equals to one eic at the power of minus one. Second, the average uniqueness of label i is the average uti over the label lifespan. This average uniqueness can also be interpreted as the average uniqueness formula on this slide as a reciprocal of the harmonic average of CT over the event's lifespan. The histogram of uniqueness values derived from an object T1 is presented on this slide, as well as with the code. Let's move to bagging classifiers and uniqueness. The probability of not selecting a particular item I after I draws with replacement on a set of I items is one minus I to the power of minus one, the power of I. As the sample size grows, the prob that probability converges to the synthetic value of i to the power of minus one, e to the power of minus one. That means that the number of unique observations drawn is expected to be 66%. Now suppose that the maximum number of non-overlapping outcomes is k lower or equal than i. Following the same argument, the probability of not selecting a particular item i after i draws with replacement on a set of i items is one minus k minus one uh, to the power of minus one to the power of i. As the sample size grows, that probability can be approximated to as e to the power of minus k over i. That means that the number of unique observations is, is decreasing as seen on this formula. The implementation is that incorrectly assuming IID draws leads to oversampling. When sampling with replacement bootstrap, an observation with I to the power of minus one 
to the sum of the average uniqueness of a label will be extremely lower than one. It becomes increasingly likely that in-bag observations will be redundant with each other and very similar to out-of-bag observations. So as a conclusion, redundancy of draws makes the bootstrap inefficient. First solution that is not advisable is to drop overlapping outcomes before performing bootstrap. Overlaps are not perfect and dropping an observation just because there is a partial overlap will result in an extreme loss of information. Second and better solution is to utilize the average of uniqueness to reduce the undue influence of outcomes that contain redundant information. Third and better solution is to perform a sequential bootstrap where draws are made according to a changing probability that controls for redundancy. So we now move on to the sequential bootstrap method in which an observation is drawn from a uniform distribution uh, between one and I, that is the probability of drawing any particular value is originally delta one equal to I to the power of minus one. And then we continue on, on drawing uh, more draws to reduce the probability of drawing an observation with a highly overlapping outcome. The process is then repeated until I draws have taken place. The sequential bootstrap scheme has the advantage that overlaps, even repetitions are still possible but decreasingly likely. The sequential bootstrap sample will be much closer to IID samples than drawn from the standard bootstrap method mentioned before. This can be verified by measuring an increase in the product between I to the power of minus one and the summation of the uh, average uniqueness relative to the standard bootstrap method. And here we implement the sequential bootstrap method uh, using programming language Python and pandas and numpy libraries. We start by building um, indicator matrix, and then we compute the average of uniqueness. And finally, we return the sample from the sequential bootstrap method. Moving on, we can also carry on Monte Carlo experiments in order to evaluate the efficiency of the sequential bootstrap algorithm through experiential methods. The first step is generating a random T1 series followed by we're computing the uniqueness from standard and sequ sequential bootstraps and a multi-threaded Monte Carlo simulation. And on the, on the bottom right, we can see the graph comparing Monte Carlo experiments of standard versus sequential bootstrap. Moving on, we, we can also speak about the return attribution topic. So in the previous slide, we learned that the method to bootstrap samples closer to IID in this section, we will return, we will introduce a method to weight those samples for the purpose of training a machine learning algorithm. Highly overlapping outcomes would have dis disproportionate weights if considered equal to non-overlapping outcomes. At the same time, labels associated with large absolute returns should be given more importance than labels with negligible absolute returns. When labels are a function of the return sign minus one or one or standard labeling of zero to one for meta labeling, the sample weights can be defined in terms of the sum of the attributed returns over the event's lifespan. We see below the, the formula of the weights and hence the summation of the weights is equal to I. The rationale behind is that we wish to weight an observation as a function of the absolute log return that can be attributed uniquely to it. However, this method will not work if there is a neutral or return below threshold case. For that case, lower return should be assigned higher weights, not the reciprocal. The neutral case is unnecessary, as it can be implied by a minus one or a one prediction with low confidence. This one, this is one of the several reasons the author generally advises to drop neutral cases. We here see the coding example of the return attribution. And we move on to another important topic, which is time decay. The reasoning why time decay topic is important is that markets are adaptive systems, and as markets evolve, older examples are less relevant to the newer ones. Thus, we simply like to sample weights to decay as new observations arrive. So let dx be our time decay factors that will be, that will be multiplied by the sample weights derived previously. So the final weight has no decay, meaning the decay factor is equal to one. Since time is not meant to be chronological in this implementation, 
decay takes place according to cumulative uniqueness because a chronological decay would reduce weights to too fast in the presence of redundant observation. We can implement the, the time decay using the following code. It is also worth discussing a, a couple of interesting cases the author mentions. So in the case of C equal to one, there will be no time decay. While when zero is between, when, when C is between zero and one, it means that the weights decay linearly over time, but every observation still receives a strictly positive weight, regardless of how old it is. When C is equal to zero, this means that weights con converge linearly to zero as they become older. And when C is smaller than, one, than zero, means that the oldest proportion CT of the over observations receive zero weight. In other words, they are erased from the memory. And finally, we also address the class weights uh, topic. So in addition to the sample weights, it's often very useful to apply class weights. Class weights are weights to correct for underrepresented labels. And this is particularly cr uh, critical in classification problems where the most important classes have fair occurrences. For example, suppose that you wish to predict liquidity crisis, like the flash crash of May 6th of 2010. These events are rare relative to the millions of observations that take place in between them. Unless we assign higher weights to the samples associated with those rare labels, the machine learning algorithm will maximize the accuracy of the most common labels and flash crashes will be deemed to be outliers rather than rare events. <laughs>